back and we're getting toward um, 312. I'm skipping over the TD Barnes explanation about 311. You can read that yourself. And then look at Appendix 2, which is right here. All right, and compare it and see what you think. I'm not going to go into much more detail on that. I, only enough to, to get the chronology going. Um, at this point, we have stopped. In 310, he's defeated Maximinian. Maxentius is still in, the son of Maximinian, is still in control of Rome, so it's still a threat because Rome is strategically placed to take over Africa, whereas Constantine is still up in, you know, Gaul and Britain, so he's kind of too far away. So logistically, he's got to do something to better consolidate his gain in Africa. And really, strategically, the only way he can do that is to go to Rome and beat Maxentius. To this end, and I, I made a mistake, Constantia is Constantine's half-sister, not his daughter. He arranges for Licinius to marry Constantine's half-sister. Okay, but that arrangement was done in 310. It was not done in, the, the nuptials take place in 313. But the arrangement was done in 310. Okay? was Constantine's half-sister, you know, pretty young at the time. What Constantine didn't bank on was that she would be in love with Licinius. And it looks like maybe he was in love with her, too. I cover all th that issue in Appendix 2, so you'll have to go read that. Because I think that's key to the whole story, why we know that Diocletian died in 316. It's this marriage right here. Okay, that plus the misreading of Aurelius Victor and the misreading of Lactanius in Latin by Barnes. Okay, it's an easy misreading to do. I, you know, anyway, you can view that in your own free time. The point is, is that at 310, this is what was happening. Okay, Galerius dies, Licinius takes over. It's May 311. Okay. At this point, remember I talked about back in 308, the nephew of Galerius, named Daza. Okay, oh please, oh crud, it's going to go to the website. Uh, I have to wait. Okay, this is ccel.org, I'm just going to kill it. Okay, because I don't want to deal with that right now. Daza was always the odd man out. Okay, he was a young hothead. He was very much younger than Licinius. Licinius is nine years older than um, Const uh, Constantine. <coughs> Daza gets all nervous when he realizes what the game is. So he immediately, when Licinius dies, he, he grabs territory. And he makes a treaty with Licinius to split up Galerius' territory. Okay, and he makes a secret treaty with Maxenius too. Now Maxenius is um, married to Galerius's daughter. All right, so Daza too is playing both sides of the fence. See, this is all these dynastic interchanges is one of the oldest stories in history. It never works. Okay, because well, it just never works. It didn't work in the 20th century. Didn't work in the 19th century. You know, I mean, World War One and Two were started by uh, really royal houses that were against each other. Same thing with the Hundred Years' War, the Thirty Years' War, all the dynastic wars. It never works. But it doesn't work any better with democracies either, as we found out after World War Two. Democracies, communism, it's just people just get jealous of each other, okay? In this case, Daza was jealous of what Licinius might get because he found out, you know, you know, after Galerius, he was worried that Licinius might, you know, make nice with um, Constantine and, you know, move Daza out of the Middle East because the Middle East was still profitable enough as a result of, um, you know, being the nexus of three continents. All right, so he secretly makes nice with Maxentius in Rome. Okay, and I cover this in, in greater detail in Appendix 2. Okay? 
So, in 312, see, because this takes up most of 311, this business with the treaty, and again, Constantine just bides his time, because he's already made his arrangement with Licinius, he doesn't have to do anything. Okay, so Licinius is doing all the work, and Daza is doing all the work. Licinius basically loses a lot of territory to make nice with Daza. And Constantine just sits there, does nothing. That's pretty suspicious. Okay, so 312 comes along. A real or expedient conversion and a vision of in hoc signo vinces. Yeah, right. Just like what happened two years prior with Apollo. So that's why I make the, the little Latin lie thing here. In this sign, I in this sign we lie. Okay. In this sign we were lying. Okay, Constantine beats Maxenius at Rome. Maxenius drowns. There's a story account of his drowning in um, Aurelius Victor, and I forget whether that part of Aurelius Victor is in Latin or English. It's one of the epitomes. I usually read it in Latin, so that might be in Latin. Um, let me. If you go up here to the chrono chart, this this section up here is sources. I've got Aurelius Victor. Um, I think that one's in Latin. There's another version of Aurelius Victor in English, but I, I'm not sure if, if I've included it. Okay, it's just I, I got used to reading Latin, so I'm sorry. Um, so Aurelius Victor records what happens here. Um, where am I? Sorry. Aurelius Victor records the drowning here. And again, I forget if that's in Latin or English, but you can find an English version of it. This is the section. It's paragraph 40, section 7 in Aurelius Victor. So if you find the English, just look up that section, and that'll talk about Maxenius's drowning. It's kind of a funny account. Okay, so then Constantine takes over Italy, and that's another link to another book. I forget which one. Okay, so obviously it was a hoax. Okay, or if there was a real sign that Constantine saw, the demons did it, because God doesn't play circus games. God doesn't do this. God doesn't do signs. That's how you know, like, Tanius wouldn't know God if, if, if the Bible bid him. You don't lie about a conversion talking about some sign that God doesn't do anymore because all signs and visions were ended. That's the theme of Hebrews 1. All the visions now go through Bible. That's also the theme of 1 Corinthians 13. So Lactanius never read those books. It talks about a sign. Okay, obviously he was more pagan than the pagans. All right, so our boy Constantine didn't know the Bible either and didn't care. Okay? But God used him anyway, just like God used Pharaoh. Alright? So Constantine and Licinius now are best buds, except that they're really not. They're secretly behind the scenes, you know, uh, maneuvering against each other. But right now they're all hunky dory because, you know, at the end of 312, Rome is now under Constantine's feet, and Licinius, who has a lot more territory than Constantine, needs Constantine's help, and of course he's he's going to marry the half-sister. So he's hedging his bets, and they issue the so-called Edict of Milan, and there's a link where you can read at Fordham University, the Edict of Milan in February 313. Okay, I have many different sites, you know, the, the, there's no one you know, one set of links that I'm using. I'm using different sites at different places. Okay, a lot of it is CCEL because that's where the church father writings are. But see, like this is Fordham, and this is some book, I don't know what it is, about the Jews of Byzantium. Okay, now when you read the Edict of Milan, contrary to what's represented by the Catholic Church, the Edict of Milan does not say that Constantine and Licinius believe in Christ. It does not say anything particularly pro-Christian. All it says is that there should be freedom of religion. Now this buttresses, it's 313, 
the marriage. Okay, this is really important. This is the marriage of Licinius and Constantine's half sister. It's February of 313. Diocletian was invited to that marriage and he refuses to attend. So he's not dead. You can't refuse to attend if you're dead. All right? And that's because T.D. Barnes thinks that, 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 that our boy Diocletian's already dead. This Edict of Milan is exactly in line with the policy of Diocletian all along. It's just that Diocletian adopted a persecution policy under Galerius. But Galerius is dead now. Licinius had continued Galerius's policy so long as Galerius was alive. But now, because of this switch in the gods in 312, Licinius knows which side his bread is buttered on, and he's got the Middle East. So what they're thinking of, <clears throat> this is somewhat of a speculation, but not too much, because there are a lot of scholars who agree with it. Both Constantine and Licinius realize, A, it's better to have a toleration of religion policy so that you can curry the side that you want at any time. And more importantly, what this edict does, by, it, it, it's, okay, how do I want to call this? On the one hand, it's saying total religious freedom, but on the other hand, it's criminalizing one group attacking another group. So what that does is it puts both groups, the pagans and the Christians, and bear in mind, you've got all these warring Christians up here, okay? They want political power. They want to be the religion of the empire. They're not content to share power with the pagans. They want to take over. That's why our boy had to switch which god gave him the sign for conquering. But he doesn't actually endorse Christianity. What he endorses is in totally what Diocletian was after, a unity, total religious freedom, what? Underneath the state. Diocles, Diocletian, tried to unite the state under a Roman religion which he made pagan. But what he wanted was the unity of the state. So what these guys do very cleverly, because obviously the Christians are at least half the population at this point of the entire empire, these guys say, okay, fine, you can have religious freedom. We're going to criminalize you if you go against your, some guy who's your next door neighbor who's a pagan if you're a Christian, or if you're a pagan and you go against a Christian, we're going to criminalize you. Everybody has a right to believe whatever he wants, so long as you're under the state. This has the effect of secularizing the state. It also has the effect, and this is where they go too far, they basically subordinate all religion of any kind, Christian or no, to the state. And they do that because they want to get control, particularly over the Christians who are trying to vie to be the religion of the state. And the argument that's going to happen over the next 20 years is the Christians are going to agitate to Constantine, because, oh, Constantine, you had this vision in 312. You sh that means that God should be the God of the Bible as the religion of the state. And basically what happens is that the so-called, you know, the fighters here, the writers here, just like the Christian right today, muster a great deal of support. And Constantine ends up caving in, and that's what the Council of Nicaea in 323 ends up being about. Because the Christians become so much more numerous, he basically ends up caving in. And he thinks he's going to control them that way, but they end up getting the upper hand. And then his kids, therefore, fight one set of Christians against another set of Christians. That's where you get the Arian controversy. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's where you get the Arian controversy and the Nestorians versus the Trinitarians in Athanasia. Athanasius, the stupid guy. Can't stand him. Okay? And it goes back and forth, back and forth between the people who say that, you know, the Arians 
and the Nestorians versus the Trinitarians. And that occupies the next 20, 30, 40 years of history. Which is why Paul says Christianity goes in the tank. Christians fighting against Christians. Total civil war. And also, of course, persecuting all the Jews and also persecuting the pagans. Everything that the Diocletian was, Constantine becomes. Against Christians. And it all started with the Edict of Milan, which was basically a good idea. But where they go wrong is the so-called total religious freedom is really the state has oversight over all religion, Christian or no. Has restitution of property that, you know, that's a little to buy everybody off. And they team up in marriage. Okay? That was done for a lot of reasons. But particularly get rid of Daza. Okay? Daza was busy persecuting, here's the link, Christians and Jews. And I got to tell you that that link is a little bit, um, well, that particular one is better. Um, the story that Lactanius tells about Daza persecuting the Jews is really bad. And Eusebius isn't much better. Those are the two guys who talk about Daza a lot. Okay, and then he, this is an outside link that's a more modern um, take on the situation with Daza. Daza, as always, is the odd man out. He gets real ticked off about this. Okay, and basically what Daza had done, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, what Daza had done is when he, um, where was it? When he splits up the territory with Licinius, um, where was it? Yeah, when he splits up the territory with Licinius, part of that package deal in 311 was to take the the widow of Galerius and Prisca, the mother, who was the wife of Diocletian, who was living with um, <clears throat> with her daughter. And Candidianus, who was the, the son of Galerius, by his previous wife or girlfriend, one of the two, um, who Candidianus was somebody that uh, Galeria Valeria, Galeria Valeria loved. Galeria Valeria was the wife of Galerius. Daza takes those people hostage as part of this split up deal, and Licinius allows it. Because what does he care? You know, he's going to marry Constantia, all right, which he does in February 313. But but they're also going to end up trying to free the hostages, you know, once they defeat Daza. Okay, well, but Daza sort of preempts them, okay? What Daza then does is just after this is done, Daza gets all nervous. He attacks Byzantium in April. He succeeds at first, he hits Heraclea, Licinius then of course wars against him and defeats him. Daza flees in disguise and by the summer of 313, Daza is dead with his, he was already married, that didn't stop him from wanting Galeria Valera. Daza is dead and his wife and kids are murdered by the summer of 313. Okay, but when this happens, Licinius is doing all the work. Constantine isn't helping Licinius, even though Licinius is now married to Constantine's half-sister. So you know that that rankled Licinius. Okay, he's doing all the work to get rid of Daza. Okay? But that did free up the believers in the Middle East from Daza's attacks against Christians and Jews. See how God is working things together? I've kind of got a far follow of the text, but this is the theme of this period. Okay? God's own standard delight, will, and purpose. As you'll notice, we're seeing Constantine's delight, will, and purpose. Licinius's delight, will, and purpose. Okay? Daza, Maxanius, blah, 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 all between 308 and 320. But God is achieving his own delight, will, and purpose. 
and at this point in 313 that the light will and purpose of God was to give everybody a breather and you get restitution of property religious freedom and a sort of clamp down on these guys Lactanius and his ilk who are trying to get political power so that Christianity is a state religion God has blunted them through the ambitions of these two neither of which are Christian. They do not commit to any idea of God in the Edict of Milan for themselves personally. They do not say that they're Christians. Okay. Meanwhile, Daza is dead and the Middle East is a little more free for religion to flourish. You know, Christianity and any other religion to flourish. Okay. So, Israel and Christianity can finally breathe again in the power centers. Okay, and Licinius, he goes off and fights the Persians. Now, what's interesting here is that the Persians had um, a huge amount of growth. That's why I said that they moved eastward and in the hinterlands in the upper upper west, you know, in Gaul and Britain and all that. But they also moved into Parthia. And the Persians experienced such a growth of Christianity that their ruler, Tithridates, had converted to Christ. And that was a problem for Licinius, which is one reason why while Galerius was alive, and Galerius himself, had anti-Christian policies. Well, what happened? Under Galerius and Licinius, the people who, who were Christians fled to the Persians. So you had an influx of Christians in Parthia. First, you know, because of the persecutions, and second, because a lot of the Persians, you know, found Christianity compelling, and they believed, including the ruler. So that became a little haven in the east. So you had a haven in the west, and you had a haven in the east, and in the center, all the persecution under Diocletian was having its heyday. Diocletian, Galerius, Licinius. See how God's will and purpose? See, that's the theme of this period. According to Paul, God's will and purpose is being realized while everybody else is trying to realize his will and purpose by intermarriages and games. All right? As a result of which, you got the Edict of Milan, God giving Christian, Christians a little breather.